Well, it is so good to see you today. Praise God for you being here. Glad that you all decided to be with us here at Vertical Church. If you're new here, welcome. <laughs> My name is Ryan. I get to serve as lead pastor here at Vertical Church, and it is a blessing to be able to be with you today as we start a brand new sermon series. Start a brand new sermon series today called Real Love, Real Love, Real Love. As your pastor, my responsibility uh, is to make sure that we are walking through the Bible together as a church. And every year we try to do a book study where we're going to expositorily preach through an entire book of the Bible. And so this year we're going to be walking through 1 John. Uh, A heads up, next year, next year we're going to be reading through the Bible together, the entire Bible as a church. We're going to be preaching from Genesis to Revelations. Yeah, yeah, we're going to walk through the book. Yeah. Yeah, so, so if you haven't read the Bible before, join us in 2024. Amen. See how I did that? Nobody saw that? Nobody picked up on what I did? You got it? Praise God. So join us. We're going to be reading the Bible together. Uh, we'll be preaching through uh, what you are reading, doing your daily reading plan, and I believe it's going to be a blessing uh, to us here at, at the church. And so uh, today, as we read through and work through First John, you can go ahead and read ahead if you would like, but we're going to be preaching through this book over the next several weeks, and so I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited about that. We talk about this here at Vertical Church, building a discipleship culture. We want people to know God deeply and follow God fully, and a part of that is knowing the love of God, that the love that we share with one another is because of the love we have received Uh, from Jesus Christ. So let me just make sure I'm clear that this sermon series is not a romantic relationship series. All right, so let me be clear. It's not what this is. It's about your relationship with God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Your relationship with brothers and sisters in Christ. This ain't a sermon series to help you get your bow ass. We don't ascribe to reading Ruth that way. That story is about redemption, not about how to get you a man. We'll find that out next year when we read through the Bible together. I'll leave that alone for now. Some of y'all just got mad. You say, I came here for the real love series. Well, you about to get this work. That's what we're going to do today. But it's about our relationship with brothers and sisters in Christ. And today we're talking about the fellowship factor. Fellowship is a part of our relationship as believers and it just kind of reminds me, I don't know about you guys, but there were seasons in my life where, y'all, I didn't always have transportation of my own, L. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I uh, had a group of friends, and uh, sometimes uh, only one of us had transportation. Yeah, yeah, I don't know about y'all, but we all, okay, we all got in the car together. Wasn't wise, wasn't safe. More people than seatbelts. That's neither here nor there. Because the thing of the matter of the matter was, we all wanted to be together. We were all going to the game. We were all going to where, I can't tell you where we was going. But we were going wherever we were going, and we were all going together. Because some of y'all are judging me. I can feel it in the room. I feel it from way up here. You would judge your boy. But, but, but we wanted to do this thing together. We didn't want to leave anybody out. We want everybody to join us. We want everybody to be there. And this has to be the same context of our relationship with God. We don't want to just have this relationship with God by ourselves. Salvation, yes, is personal, but it's never meant to be private. We're called to do this thing together, and so I believe when we look at 1 John, specifically these first few verses, we see and understand that that real love is going to create fellowship. It's going to create community. Let's, let's think about this for real. Listen, when, you, when you're in a car with, with seven other people and it's a five-passenger car, that's love. Say what you want. There'll be a lot of overlapping. Some of y'all, nobody want to sit in the middle, right? Come on now. If you're the short person, you know, we ain't going to tell you what we call the middle seat, but that's not just here to there. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, but, but it takes love to be in real fellowship with people. Not association, not acquaintances, not people you know, but to do life with people for real, for real, it takes real love. And we see this in the text, and I believe we're going to walk through this today. So let's just read through uh, the first chapter of 1 John, starting at verse number 1. It says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our, what, eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest. And we have seen it 
and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. Verse 3, that which we have seen and heard we proclaim to you also so that you too may have fellowship with us and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things that, so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light and he is the light, we have fellowship with the one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. His word is not in us. This is the first chapter of the first letter of John. I want to talk today about our fellowship with God and our fellowship with others. Write this down if you can. Our main idea is this. Good students take notes. Real love produces fellowship in God through Jesus Christ with others. Real love produces fellowship in God through Christ with others. John's letter here is one of five that he writes in the New Testament. John, this writer, writes the gospel of John, the narrative or the account of the life of Jesus. He writes three letters here to the church in Asia Minor while he is in Ephesus, this group he had been with for over 30 years. And then finally, he writes the book of Revelations. So of these five, we're reading this letter, the first letter he writes to the church in Asia Minor. John writes his first letter to bring assurance not even to bring confidence in the truth of the gospel to this church. Because here at that particular time, there was a threat. There was a threat to the church. There was a threat, and, and most people would articulate that this group called Gnostics or those that practiced Gnosticism. They were not just a threat outside the church. They were a threat in the church. John writes these letters to help assure the church of the truth of the gospel. Some of the things that Gnostics believed, that there was no sin in the flesh, that we were only sinful by the Spirit, had no effect on the Spirit. So what you did really didn't matter. If you believed that you were saved, you didn't have to live a certain way. Gnostics also, they believed that you could ascend to a certain level of knowledge. There was a, an, an academic ascension. There was a cognitive ability to ascend the truth, and it had no bearing on how you lived your life. John writes to ensure the church that the message of the Gnostics or Gnosticism was false and not of Christ. He does this to say, listen, I got to assure you of the good news of Jesus Christ. His approach in his letter is redemptive, not reactive. John wants his listener and his reader, and not just for them, but anyone that would read this letter, he wants his reader to refine their theological understanding and sharpen their ethical rigor and heighten their devotional intensity to both God and fellow believers. Let me say it again. He wants them to refine their theological understanding, sharpen their ethical rigor, and heighten their devotional intensity both to God and fellow believers. He says, I want you to have confidence in what you know and believe. I want you to respond with obedience and it should be done in devotion to both God and others in the body of Christ. So if I were to summarize all of 1 John, I would summarize it like this. We have assurance in the person, work, and love of Christ. Therefore, we should live out the love of Christ before Christ and with others. John aims to, to, to test or to, to, to assure or to test the genuineness of our faith. He does this with a doctrinal test. Do you believe in Jesus is the Son of God? He wants you to make sure you have right belief in Jesus. Secondly, as we're going to read through this over the next couple of weeks, you're going to see the moral test. Do you obey God? This is do you have the right response to Jesus? 
And then thirdly, the love test. Do you love God and his children? Do you love like Jesus? He's going to walk through this over the next few chapters in his, in his book, and I believe it's important that we understand this is the, the aim of what John is trying to ask and trying to call the church to, that they would believe the right thing about Jesus, they would respond the right way to Jesus, and they would love others the right way for Jesus. It's important to remember that this testing of the genuineness of the faith is not a pass or fail. It's a development. It's the maturing of our faith. His aim, listen to me, is not to give you a list of do's and don'ts. His aim is to get you to respond to the good news of Jesus Christ for what has already been done. Y'all with me? Saying that what Christ has done on the cross is sufficient. It's enough. That Christ now becomes not the picture of our salvation, not just the picture of our salvation, but the picture of how we live our life with other people. Amen. So here's my prayer as your pastor. A couple of things I want you to write these down because I want you to pray over these for the next few weeks as we go through this series. Number one, I want us to, to pray and see, pray that God, we could be confident in God's real love. It's my prayer for you that you would find confidence in God's real love. Some of us struggle to believe that God loves us. Somebody say amen. But there, there are times where the things that you do or say Sometimes you're reminded of things in the past, and, and sometimes we're not confident that God really loves us. So that's my prayer through this series, that you would be confident in God's real love. Secondly, we want to faithfully and obediently respond to God's real love. So if we believe that God loves us, then we should respond to God's love with faithfulness and obedience. This is what we're praying through this week. God, God, I pray that we would, would not just know your love, but we would respond to your love with faithfulness and with obedience. So I want you to hear this. Real love deserves a real response. Amen? I'm going to say it again. Real love deserves a real, a real response. So we want to be confident in God's real love. We faithfully and obediently want to respond to God's real love. And then thirdly, we want to live out God's real love with each other. We want to live out God's real love with each other. I want to build your confidence through this series. I want to develop your response through this series. And I want you to, to see that that response is seen in our relationships. Say it again. I think sometimes we think our response to God's love is directed back towards God. He says, and they will know that you love me, you follow me, that you're my disciples, by how what? How you love one another. So I see a lot of people say, I love God. But you don't love God's children. Oh, God, you're so great. But I can't stand your people. I want you, but I don't want them. I can't imagine somebody inviting to celebrate me, to show appreciation to me, and tell me your wife and your children can't come. I'm going to tell you what you just did. You just uninvited me. Confident in God's love responding to God's love, and living it out with, with others. So today, I want to talk about how this starts, and it starts with fellowship. It starts with fellowship, and I believe in, in this text that we see the foundations of fellowship. So let's write this down. Number one, good students take notes. Uh, we want to talk about fellow, fellowship foundations. What are the foundations of our fellowship with God and with others? Fellowship foundations. If we're going to embrace the truth of God's love, we need to have a firm foundation of the fellowship that we have. Let's look at it right here in the text. 1 John 1, 1 through 2, it's right here. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. 
This L would be considered the prologue for the book of John, and it's kind of wild to me because John does not give any type of greeting or salutation, Ben. He doesn't say hello. He doesn't say it's your boy John. He doesn't say I'm praying these things for you. At least Paul gives an introduction, a welcome, something. Now, John has a little, little tone here to the text because he's trying to help us to understand the urgency and the importance of what he's trying to address. Remember, these Gnostics or Gnosticism was trying to infiltrate the church, this false doctrine, this false belief of Christ. And John is saying, listen, we cannot, we don't got time for the pleasantries. I got to get right to the issue at hand. And the issue at hand is we got to make sure we answer the Jesus question. What is the Jesus question? Was he or is he actually real? Because Gnostics were teaching that he was not actually the son of God. He, he didn't really exist. He was just a spiritual being, but he wasn't a real person. And John says, listen, I got to start with this. If we're going to talk about God's love, we got to make sure we understand the foundation is that Jesus is and was real. He says he's a real Jesus. If fellowship with God is by Christ, y'all, we must confirm that he's real. John gives us a couple of things that helps us understand that he's real. First, he deals with time. Everybody say time. He says in the beginning of this, he says, that which was from the beginning. He's talking about Christ. He was from the beginning. He was, he was from the beginning, which he, we have heard. He's from the beginning. He's trying to articulate this picture that this Christ that we talked about, he exists before time. This is important for us to understand because it helps the reader understand that, listen, that this Jesus we're talking about, he's not man-made. He, he's not something that we've just come up with. He, he, he's, he's not something that people have put together. He was not designed and created. No, he existed before time. John is speaking of what we call the divine preexistence of Christ. That, that he existed before there was time. Uh, the same John, remember I told you, wrote the Gospel of John. He says the same thing in the very first verse of the Gospel of John. Watch, go John chapter number one, verse one. Watch what the text says. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is the same person talking here, and he's saying the exact same thing, that Jesus Christ pre-existed before time. When time started, Jesus already had a past. This is the confidence you got to have because when you understand that Jesus exists outside of the things that you and I exist in, it helps you to understand about his power, his truth, and his glory. He's not man-made, he's not created, he's not developed. He does not simply, watch this, exist in time, within time, space, and matter. No, he exists beyond time, space, and matter. Yeah. But John says that's not enough. He says that not only was he from the beginning, but, but we have heard him, we have seen him with our eyes, we looked upon him, and we have touched him with our hands. John is saying, not only does he exist beyond time, space, and matter, but by his beautiful grace and love for us, he came down through time, space, and matter and showed up on earth. What are you talking about? He existed 2,000 years ago. There are actual factual resources and documents outside of the Bible that speaks of the existence of Jesus Christ. He came in time. He came in a space. He was born where? In Bethlehem. There is the space that he existed in. He came in the form of matter. What was that? The form of a baby boy. So he existed outside. He pre-exists time, space, and matter. But because of his love for us, he came to us through time, space, and matter. And he says, this, this is the good news, John says, that, that we didn't just see him. We didn't just hear him, but we touched him. You got to catch that. that that's that's, that's important here. That, that's, that's important. It, it's not enough just to hear him because, because we've heard the voice of God in the Old Testament. You, you might have been hearing things. It's not even enough just to see him. 
Uh, we, we saw the prophets, but, but, but to have touched, watch this, a resurrected Savior. Oh, that's something else. Okay, let me see if I can make a plane here. So some of y'all, y'all, y'all ever heard a TV show or a uh, museum? Uh, Ripley's Believe It or... See, see, settle down, Wesley. Uh, uh, he had a question. Not, not, not right there. I got you. I got you. I got you. Uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not, you see something, you hear something, but to really, to really be sure, you feel like you got to do what? I got to touch it. These are the higher senses that we have to see to hear and, and, and to touch. And, and you might see something, you might hear something. Well, once you touch something, it's confirmation that it's real. Let me show it to you what John says in chapter number 20, uh, verse 26 through 29 of his gospel account of Jesus' life. Uh, after Jesus Christ had died and been resurrected from the grave, this is what happens. Verse 26, eight days later. Mm-hmm. His disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came in, came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. John says, I was in the room when the doors were locked and he came in. I was in the room, God, I feel like preaching now, when when, when he said, look at the nail prints in my hands. I was in the room when he said, put your hand in the side where they speared me. I was in the room. I saw him. I heard him and I touched him. He lives. John says, church, you got to believe this. You got to know that this is true, that he is real. Verse number one again, he says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the the word of life. Y'all keep it right there for me. When I saw this, there was something that jumped out to me. It said, which we have seen with our eyes, comma, which we have looked upon. Now, I don't know about y'all, but don't that sound like the same thing? John, are you just being repetitive for the sake of being repetitive? John, did you forget what you just said? No, we heard you the first time when you said you looked and saw him. But but, but this is two different communications. One is to say we see him with our eyes, but to look upon is actually John saying we come to observe, to evaluate, to to, to measure, to, to confirm what we're seeing. He's It sounds like the same thing, but it's very, very different. It's to give special attention to. John says, I I saw him, y'all. I I looked upon him. And again, one of the reasons why he did this is because the Gnostics or Gnosticism would teach that Jesus didn't really exist. He was merely a ghost or a phantom. We, We talk about this in James when we look at the book of James and how James talks about how Jesus He revealed himself to the apostles, to the disciples, and 500 men at the same time. Why does he say this? Because he's trying to get them to understand. If you say you saw somebody that was resurrected and you're the only person that can attest to this, you might have saw an hallucination. But if 500 people say they saw it, it might be real. He's trying to help them understand that, no, Jesus really existed. He's not a ghost. He's not a phantom. He's trying to address the issue of the doctrine of incarnation of Christ. He's trying to address the issue of the doctrine of the incarnation of Christ. What is this doctrine we're talking about of incarnation? This idea that God became flesh. John is trying to refute these ideas and put forth by the Gnostics that Christ only appeared to be human, that he was a ghost. He refutes the idea that the spirit of Christ came on Jesus when he was baptized and left when he was crucified. John says, no, we must understand the essential doctrine of the incarnation of Christ, that the biblical Jesus is no myth, 
no fairy tale, no fable, no ghost, no illusion. He was real. He is indeed God who took on full humanity. He was both fully God and fully man at the same time. He's not half God. He's not half man. He's fully both. This is what we call the hypostatic union, that he is both God and man at the same time. John Piper calls this the the stumbling block of incarnation, the stumbling block of incarnation. There are people that like the idea of a Jesus that is just spiritual, but, but the moment he is not just spiritual, he was physical, it often caused a stumbling block for people. That this idea that a particular man came to a particular place with a particular commands, dying on a particular cross for particular sins to change our particular lives, then he becomes a particular problem. Because if he is real, if he is who he says that he is, if he did what he said that he did, then, then it changes everything. We, we, we must listen to him. We must obey him. We must respond to him. We must worship him. When God becomes man in the form of Jesus, then man no longer remains the measure of all things. He does. His incarnation violates our sin-sick nature of doing our own thing our own way. This Real love is because of a real Jesus. I would love to just assume that everybody in the room believes this, but I want to come here today to remind you that Jesus is real. Yes, 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 he is, he is real. His love is real. His sacrifice was real. His, his death was real, and his resurrection is real. And I'm, I'm saying this because we live in a culture that wants to poke holes in the authenticity of who Jesus is. There are more documents from antiquity that confirm the identity and the person and the truthfulness of who Jesus was that are not related to the Bible than there are about the Caesar of that day. That's that's like saying, that there's, there's 13,000 documents of antiquity that would prove that a little country boy from Hillsborough passed a little church in Hillsborough on Highway 57. There's more documents that speak of him than there are of the president of the United States of America. I don't know who this is for. He's real. And so the foundation of our fellowship is because of this real Savior that really loved, and that's what John starts with. So let me talk about the fulfillment of fellowship. For fellowship, fulfillment. Fellowship, fulfillment. It's right here in verse number three and four. Watch the text. He says, that which we have seen and heard, we also proclaim to you. So he's just summarizing the first two verses. What we saw, what we heard, what we touched, we've taught this to you. We've proclaimed it to you, the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Here it is, so that you may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the work of Christ, church. I don't know if y'all saw it, but it's right there. Carlton, this is the work of Christ. Uh, I I, I struggle with this because I I don't know how I missed this before. But but John says, we've proclaimed the gospel to you. We've given you the good news And here's why, so that you may have fellowship with us. Mess me up. Mess me up. Angela, it messed me up because I thought we were just going for salvation. John says, no, I I didn't share the gospel with you so you could be saved. He, he, he draws a bigger picture. Uh, he says, I, I, I shared the gospel with you that you might have fellowship with us. It, it Help me understand this thing, that, 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 that the salvation thing is a part of a much bigger thing. See, when we think about salvation, we think about salvation individualistically. Salvation is for me. I 
I've been saved from the penalty of my sin. But John offers something else early in his letter and says, no, this isn't even about salvation. This is really about fellowship. Okay. Uh, When we go back to Genesis chapter number three, we see the fall in the garden where Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and, And Adam didn't break a rule. God, help me. He broke fellowship. Y'all don't believe me? Go read the end of chapter number three. And the Bible says that God sent Adam and Eve out of the garden. Why? Because sin is what hinders our fellowship. John says the real problem is that we have a fellowship problem. Y'all, that our sin separates us from God. Our, Our unrighteousness, God is a holy God. And he cannot be in the presence of unrighteousness. This is why Jesus had to come and live a perfect life and die a sinner's death because that was the only way to restore fellowship. I'm not just saved from the the place of sin. I'm not just saved from the penalty of sin. I'm not just saved from the power of sin. I'm saved into fellowship with God. He wants Fellowship. This is good news of Jesus Christ. This is the good news that our real sin separated us from God. Yet in his real love, he sent his real son, Jesus, to die on a real cross. And he really was raised from the dead so that we could have real fellowship with him. This is the good news of the gospel. Fellowship. Fellowship, I want you to think about this. This is what, this is the work of sin. It destroys fellowship. Adam didn't break a rule in the garden. He broke fellowship. So, so I want us to see this, that that's real Jesus created real fellowship with God. And this is what John is saying, that you would have fellowship, he says, it's interesting, with us. So, so listen to me, it's not just fellowship with God. It's also fellowship with others. I I hear you. Oh, man. I mean, I'd just rather have fellowship with God. Okay, y'all ain't got to say amen. I I know you. We said it last week that what? People are weird. You included. You included. We're called to fellowship with God. Here it is, that you don't come to Jesus and you not come to his church. You you, you don't come to Jesus and not come to his family. We talked about this before. We talked about the power and the work of communion, how communion is not a TV dinner table. It's a family dinner table. Y- y'all ever, y'all, I mean, I grew up in church, and at the church I grew up in, they had a little table down front at the church. Say, do this in remembrance of me. It was in a funny little font, and it was one of them tables like you couldn't get close to. Couldn't touch. You couldn't put nothing on it. That was a table right there. And the table matched the pulpit, and the pulpit matched the chairs. I grew up Baptist, don't judge me. (laughs) And the reason why the table is long is because there are other people that are supposed to sit at the table. It's a dinner table, not a TV dinner table. Y'all seen TV dinner tables? That's a table for what? One. And sometimes we think coming to Jesus is getting your TV dinner table and say, God, it's just me and you. No, no, no. You are sitting at a table where there are other people that are like you, that needed God's grace, that needed God's mercy, that needed God's healing, sitting at the same table with you and Jesus. We, 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 We are called to be in fellowship with God, but also in fellowship with others. John says, I I shared this message of the gospel, and it is life. He calls it the word of life. The gospel is the word of life. It produces life, not just for you, but for others. He says, I shared this because I want other people to have life. 
that you should have fellowship with us. Y'all, I think we sometimes think about salvation so narrow-minded. It's just this, okay, now I can go to heaven. I do this salvation thing so, so that, you know, God can uh, bless my going in and my coming out in the city and in the field. I remember hearing that growing up in church. I don't know about nobody else. He would bless me. Good measure. Press down. Say, y'all went to my church. <laughs> I ain't seen none of y'all there. Dang. That's wild. That, that, that was the blessing of salvation. No, the blessing of salvation is fellowship. Our sin does not make us wrong. Our sin makes us enemies of God. And we show up to the house of God as enemies, but he invites us to sit down as guests at the table. This is the good news of the gospel. That your sin made you an enemy, but he treats you as a guest. Brings new meaning to what David says. He prepares the table before me. We like to say that part in the presence of our enemies, but we forget we were once the enemy. Fellowship is, is what he's after. This is why I was telling, telling the church, doing some consulting and coaching another church, and they, I told them they had to stop saying um, they, they offer church online. Ben, they got mad at me, bro. I said, stop, stop saying church online. Stop saying that. It's not accurate. That's a misrepresentation of the bride of Christ. You, you can't log into church. Yo, 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 like for real talk, like you can't, you can't get church on YouTube. No. Matter of fact, YouTube is not, they don't care about your salvation. Matter of fact, YouTube is designed to keep you on YouTube which is why they got all the videos on the side. And even when the service is over, it has a recommendation for you for something else. They want to keep you on YouTube. They're not caring about your soul. You can watch a service. You can listen to a sermon. But we cannot confuse and conflate that with church. And the reason why we do this is because even before our, uh, our church was online, we used to say stuff like this. We go to church. You don't go to church, you are the church. That's why we think the church is a place. No, the church has never been a place. It's a group of people that have been saved into the family of God and sent out onto the mission of God. There's no church online. You can watch, you can give, praise God for y'all to give. But you're not at church. I want us to see this, that, that the online experience is more of a convenience. But it should never be the goal. We've had people that leave here and say, Pastor, I just love your preaching, and I just, you don't want to preach in the Bible. I'm not the only one preaching the Bible. Where are you at? Go find a church there. Go there. Show up. Serve. Meet somebody. Shake their hand. Ask them their name. What an idea. Because you can't have fellowship online. I told y'all last week, we're, we're good at being social. We struggle at being relational. And the truth of the matter is that technology has made us relationally lazy. Where I can find out about you without knowing you, God. I can keep up with you without talking to you. called to fellowship with God and to with others. This, this word we call it koinonia, this, this community is what we're called to. This is why the church should be beautiful. Uh, we should see multi-ethnic, multi-generational, different nationalities, genius, transcending social structures, saying that the kingdom of God is what unites us. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ unites us. 
This is important. Fellowship is important. Let me say this again. I, I said this in first service. Like, I thought I knew what fellowship was. I grew up in a church where they had a whole hall dedicated to fellowship. <laughs> we took up a fundraiser for the fellowship hall. Oh, my God. I remember it all, oh, little, little sandwiches in the fellowship hall, meatballs, fruit trays, oh God, cheese blocks in the fellowship hall, those hard, heavy wood tables, those cold metal chairs in the fellowship hall. Got our church name written on the back of them so don't nobody steal the church chairs in the fellowship hall. And we relegated fellowship to just a moment after service. <laughs> we relegated fellowship to chips and dip. You can have chips and dip with anybody. No, no, fellowship is about doing life together, being concerned, being transparent, being truthful, being honest, sharing your life, encouraging, building, holding up. It's called fellowship, two fellows in one ship. Some of y'all just got that. <laughs> oh, that's the idea of fellowship. Here's the question. Who's in your ship? Oh, who's in your ship? You, you got a ship. The question is, who's in it? This was Christ's desire for us, church. It's right here, John 17, 20 through 21. He says, I do not ask this. This is high priestly prayer. This is the prayer that Jesus prayed. You ought to think about this. When Jesus prayed, you ought to read his prayer. He said, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through the word. He says, he's talking about not just those who follow him, but also us. Those of us that will believe, he's praying this prayer for us. Verse 21, that they may all be what? One. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. This is one of the reasons, this is one of the texts of why we pursue a multi-ethnic, multi-generational church. The power of the gospel shows us that people that don't look alike, don't sound alike, don't have, have come from the same background, the same context, may not even agree on all the same things, but because of the gospel, they can be one. He doesn't say the goal is uniformity, which says we all look alike, sound alike, talk alike, walk alike. No, he says the goal is unity. We're not trying to pursue uniformity. We're not trying to assimilate you so you to look like me and sound like me and worship like me. No, 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 no. It's to be together. That is the apologetic. That is the evangelistic tool of the gospel. You mean to tell me all these people can be together on one accord? Y'all, I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've gone out to dinner with some of you that don't look like me. My white brothers and sisters, God bless y'all. I love it when this happens. We go out to eat and they ask the question, are y'all together? <laughs> happens almost, y'all together? Yes. I hope you ask why. I know you're thinking it. Just ask it. Please open the door for me for me to share with you these three circles and give you the gospel of Jesus Christ because that's the only reason that we're together because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray to God. Why? How do you know him? Oh, man, great question. In the beginning. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Jesus' prayer was for us to be in fellowship together. The power of the gospel. Lastly, number three, we're going home right here. We have fellowship foundations. It's in Christ Jesus. We have the fellowship fulfillment. It's fellowship with one another. The fulfillment of that, it's not just salvation. It's like, y'all, we got to be together. Like, I've been saying this for a while. Like, y'all, we can't be like a family. We are a family. Okay, let me say that again. We don't want to be like a family. No, we are a family. 
that, that when I give my life to Jesus Christ, that my identity is found in Jesus, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me, first. That, 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 y'all, y'all know baptism? Anybody ever been baptized? Raise your hand. Baptized. Oh, praise God. When you get baptized, who you used to be has died. And the new person that comes up in Christ is new. And it says my identity is in Christ first. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm less black. I'm black. I don't know if y'all can tell. <laughs> I've been black, going to be black, love being black. But, but here, here it is. My identity is found in Christ before it is that I'm black. I'm a male. I'm a man. I'm a dude. I'm a bro. <laughs> Always been one. Gonna be one. Love being one. Amen? But my identity is not in my gender before it is in who I am in Christ. So my unity to you is not my gender. My unity to you is not my ethnicity. I have more in common with someone from another country that speaks another language that is a follower of Jesus Christ than I do somebody who lives next door to me that looks just like me from the same place I'm from because of Jesus Christ. That's the power of the gospel. Thirdly, we want to see the fruit of fellowship. The fruit. What is the fruit of fellowship? I love this. The fruit of fellowship is found in our joy in Christ. The fruit of fellowship is found in joy. I know, I know, I know. I know what you're thinking. Pastor, are you serious? You think there's joy in being with other, other weird people? Fellowship with other. I, I don't even like the people I'm supposed to be with. You want me to spend time with, ew, ew. I, I can't do that. I ain't, I ain't here for this. No, no, no. I want you to hear this fellowship, the joy of Christ. Right here in the text, verse 4, watch it. It says, and we are writing these things, here it is, so that our joy may be complete. Now, if you're asking the questions of the text, you're asking, well, what is an incomplete joy? Wait, John, John, come on, bro, don't do this. We're only four verses into the whole book. Is there an incomplete joy? Yes, a joy absent of fellowship. A joy absent of fellowship with God and fellowship with others. I think sometimes we belittle fellowship and rarely see the fruit that comes from the fellowship we have with God through Jesus Christ. John says this is that our joy should be complete. Many times we see in the New Testament where he talks about joy, there's always, there's always talk about a completion of joy, there's a precursor of relationship. This idea of having full joy, full joy, see it over and over, John 15, 11. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be what? Oh. John 16, 24, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, here it is, that your joy may be full. Because of this relationship, you can have full joy. Because of fellowship, you can have full joy. Joy being made complete is found in fellowship we have in Christ. We've often traded our joy for satisfaction. We want satisfaction. God's trying to give us joy. What is this joy? This joy is that I have a relationship with God. Watch this. And there's nothing that can change that. See, see, satisfaction is circumstantial. Joy, y'all got to hear this, is, is eternal. It has nothing to do with what's happening. Why, why, why is this important? Because, because, Q, my relationship with God cannot change. He died for me. He loves me. He, he, he saw me in my, my broken place, and he, he came and he pursued me. And the truth of our relationship, the truth of our fellowship cannot be changed. Regardless of what my circumstance is feeling and looking like, the truth of our fellowship remains. And that, my friends, should bring you joy. Joy is found in the completion of our, our love together, our walking together. Let me show you another picture of this. John chapter 3, verse 29 it's the same John. He's doing it over and over again. He's talking about this relational joy that we have. 
The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, watch it. This joy of mine is now complete. He says that my joy is made complete when you know Jesus. You, you, ever, been, you ever been to a wedding? Don't, don't look around. And how do I say? You were happy for them or you were happy for him or her because they were married but not happy because they were with their person. I told you not to look around. Because sometimes we got to learn to be happy for people because they know Jesus. This is what we're, this is the joy, because we know the joy of the fellowship. Fellowship should bring and create joy. Joy transcends our external circumstances. Tony Evans said it like this, joy is the stability on the inside despite what is occurring on the outside. And we have that, listen to me, church, in the context of fellowship. I told the people earlier, my wife, last couple of days, y'all, she's been doing something strange. It's been strange. Q, it's been strange. I love my wife. It's been strange. L, I've been walking lightly. Strange. I don't know where this is going. Strange. I ain't gonna lie to y'all. I've been looking over my shoulder. Strange. My wife has been coming to sit down and watch football with me. The plot thickens. Strange. I mean, I'm looking at the game, but I'm also like, what's she doing? What she want? Some, some, something's about to come down. I know, I know something is, I'm just waiting for it to say, you know, I was thinking the other day, ah, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. Strange. Okay. She's not just in the room, y'all. She's actually watching the game. She's asking questions about the game. Why are they doing this? What is that yellow thing for? <laughs> Strange. Strange. Y'all, today, we're headed in church. She said, um, who's playing regular football today? I appreciate the effort. <laughs> I was a little thrown off because I was like, regular football. I said, babe, the high school plays on Friday, college plays on Saturday, and the professionals play on Sunday. She said, so who playing? I was like, completely missed what I was trying to, to school her on. And I said, I don't know. She says, well, I'm going to be down there with you. Strange. <laughs> Y'all, she's paying attention. She's watching the game. She's all into it. Oh! <laughs> Why did they push him like that? I said, this is football. <laughs> this is literally what they do for a solid three and a half hours. <laughs> oh! Go, 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 go! <laughs> Strange. Strange. Y'all, I would get up and walk out the room. Sure enough, I would think she would walk and go back to doing what she No, she was still there. Strange. Start cleaning up, taking out the trash. She stayed right there. Strange. L, the last two, three days, I've been before the Lord. I had hit her with one of these. Like, your daughter, she's strange, Lord. Strange. She told me today, she said, I'm going to sit down there with you. Said, well, come on then, girl. She said, because 
I just enjoy being with you. Hey, 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 it don't mean it wasn't strange. <laughs> it was sweet, but strange. It, here it was, we talked about all kinds of things. We laughed at commercials, we laughed at all. Hours and hours and hours on end. Here's the thing, Lord convicted me, I just, why does fellowship feel strange? I know that some of y'all, you might be like my family. You get asked to do something, hang out. You're like, oh, I don't really got time for this. You know, these people drain me. And, and then you go there, and then you leave. You're like, I had so much fun. This fellowship felt strange. We're called to be in fellowship with one another. It's a part of our joy. I know. I hear the introverts. I hear you. I hear you. I'm with you. It's strange. It's exhausting. Some of you, raise your hand if you hear some people make me tired. I don't even, oh, wow, it's a lot of y'all, okay. <laughs> I wasn't expecting for that response. We might have to do a prayer line afterwards. Like, get right here. You're going to get a little bit of Pastor Ryan's extroverted personality. I love people. People bring me joy. Kier here, one of my brothers. I met Kier when he was maybe a junior, senior high school. Man, I just love being around him. Can, can I be honest with y'all? I love when he comes to Vertical Church. He's a great singer, literally sings all over the world. Where were you at recently? You was in Africa, United Kingdom, something like that. Sings all over the world. He would have to come sing to, you know, a little bit of church. He'd be on platforms, thousands of people everywhere. I just want to go out to eat with him afterwards. You're a great singer, Kier. I love you. I appreciate your worship. But your fellowship has changed my life. Right? We've shared hotel bedrooms. We've fallen asleep driving cars together. All kind of wild stuff, man. My brother, you can't let fellowship become strange. It's not just for extroverts. It's not just for introverts. No, no. We all are part of that. Yeah, with me. This is why we invite you to, to join a missional community and discipleship group. Come to tribal. Come to tribal. You need fellowship. You need to be around some people that love Jesus. Whether it's five or five thousand, come. Come to the growth track. You need community. Later in this text, verse 9, it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and the cleanses of all unrighteousness. This confession piece is, is about fellowship. Why do we need to confess our sins if Jesus already knows? You confess them so, so it removes the tension of fellowship. You ever had somebody do you wrong? If they don't acknowledge it, you know it, but if they don't acknowledge it, it's their tension in the relationship. He's going to forgive you. He just said it. If you confess, this is so we can have fellowship. You need people in your life that can encourage you and build you up. You do yourself a disservice to do life in isolation. Let me say that again. You do yourself a disservice when you do life in isolation. Here's the thing that I know, I know, I hear you. I hear you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. And some of you are saying, well, I don't need them. Well, they may need you. Get over it yourself. I don't need nobody in my business. Maybe they need you in theirs. Go. Show up. Be present. Leave your attitude in the car. Ew. Nobody want all that. If you got an attitude, at least be honest and tell us, hey, I ain't really feeling it today, guys. All right, cool. We need to pray for you right now. Don't forsake fellowship. You don't go to church. You attend a church service. You belong to a church. That's why here at Vertical Church, we want you to believe, belong. Y'all got it? You get it? Let's all stand. I want to pray for you before we go.